right, thanks for joining us today for worship. We pray that you experience God today in a fresh way, in a way that touches your heart, a way that engages your mind, a way that challenges your spirit, in a way that gives you hope and gives you peace. There's some ways that you can engage with us this morning. You can like the service as you experience it. You can comment on it and say, hey, I'm here, my family's here. You can also share it there on social media where you're watching it and joining in. We have some other things going on that you might want to get in on. We're still doing Vacation Bible School. That's an online experience. You can come by the church office and get a bag of supplies for your children, grandchildren, neighbor kids, and that'll give you instructions on how to find the material online. Also, on Wednesday evenings, I'm doing a Bible study life transformation group. We're meeting in the grassy area by the church parking lot where we do 9 a.m. outdoor worship. Just bring a lawn chair and a Bible and come join us, and we'll have a good time together. The youth will be having a fishing event the evening of August 15th. If you'd like to be a part of that, you need to RSVP to the church office by August 12th. In our service today, we're going to have some special music from one of my friends, Pastor Andrew Whitener. He's pastor of New Life Assembly of God Church here in town, and I'm sure you'll enjoy his sharing with you. There are many things that we as humans can build our lives on. There's so many measuring sticks we can use when we figure out what's of greatest value. In our opening song today, we declare that we build our lives on Christ alone. We stand on him. We find our strength in Him. We stand secure in Him. We can do this because He's given His life, His everything for us. If you're able to, we stand and join us as we sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand in christ alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless faith this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i Here in the power of Christ 
I'll stand No power of hell No scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns Or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Good morning. Today, we will be affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed. This creed has been shared by Christians throughout the world as a reminder of our united beliefs. So we, will you join me now as we affirm our faith, saying, I believe in the God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come to the part of the service where we talk about giving. Giving is more than finances. When we talk about giving, we're talking about giving our lives to God. This is why when you decide to become a part of our church body here, you're asked to give of your time, your talents, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Each of these things is an act of following Jesus. We are grateful for those who serve with their time both inside and outside the church walls and ministries that serve to grow both the church and the community. We're also grateful for those who utilize their talents in our music ministry and working behind the scenes to make our services possible. We're grateful for your witness, letting God be present in your daily lives. And we're also grateful for your gifts, both prayer and financially. If you'd like to give a financial gift, we want you to know the various ways that you can do so. You can bring your offering by the church office during normal business hours, you can mail your offering to 201 North Mount Street, Fairfield, Texas, 75840, or you can utilize one of our online giving options. You can download the Tithely app to your phone or go to the church website, click on the giving link, which will give you instructions on how to share your financial gift. However you choose to give, we want you to know that we are grateful. And now, let us join together in prayer focusing on the one who first gave to us so that we, in turn, can give to him. God of great wonders, you gave us a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You give us life and breath. You fill the world with beauty and our hands with bounty. You fill our hearts with the desire to give. So now we ask that you would accept these gifts and ourselves in service in every season. Amen.
go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we live in a world today full of anxiety. In our own neck of the woods, we're still dealing with this pandemic. We wished it, it would last it maybe a week, maybe a month, and, and then it'd be gone. Gone by summer, we'd hoped that. And then everything back to normal, but that's not what we're seeing. Lord, give us comfort, give us peace. Help us to live our lives in such a way that we can bring all of our anxieties to you, whether it's our anxieties over the pandemic, our anxieties over the economy, our anxieties over what's happening in our families, in our community, in our nation, or in our world. Help us to entrust all of those anxieties to you and to find that peace that transcends all understanding that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And Lord, as we experience that for ourselves, help us know how to share that with the people around us, to live in such a way, whether it's face-to-face, in conversations on the phone, or what we put out on social media, let the way we present ourselves show that peace, show that we've given you our anxieties, show that we're full of love and we can love even our enemies, even those we don't like because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Lord, we see other things happening in the world. Our hearts are broken today for the explosion, that huge explosion that rocked Beirut this past week with hundreds who died, thousands injured. I saw over 300,000 left homeless. Lord, have mercy on them. We know their country has been falling apart and in great chaos and turmoil for a generation, and now this. Lord, raise up your people there in Beirut. Give them boldness to stand for Jesus, boldness to love their neighbors. Give them the blessings and the resources they need to help the people around them. Encourage them and show us here in America, we who are far away, we we have some of our own issues. Show us how we can help them and be a blessing to them. And Lord, uh, we reach out in mission here. We thank you for the opportunities you've given us. Continue to show each of us how we can share you with the people around us, whether it's in our family, in our neighborhood, at school, at work, wherever it is that we open our lives up. Give us a passion for people and a true love for them. Finally, this morning, Lord, we pray for our Texas annual conference meeting that will be happening at the end of the week. It's a very strange thing for us to not be able to meet face-to-face and see each other's face like we sing about. Help us as we rely on this technology that we've never used to such a degree before. Let our conference and our meeting together bring you honor and glory and advance what you're trying to do here in our part of the world. And now, Lord, as students of Jesus, as his apprentices, we pray to you just as he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today we will be reading about a part of Jesus' ministry from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. We encourage you to follow along as we read in your own Bible or with the words printed on the screen. Beginning in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Two weeks ago, we saw Jesus doing something rather strange. He was at a point ministering in Capernaum where he could have gone on doing more effective ministry, where the crowds were there waiting for him. But no, Jesus went out into the wilderness. Jesus went out where he could experience solitude, silence, and prayer. Now, this is doubly strange because of who Jesus is. We Christians confess that Jesus isn't just an ordinary guy. Jesus is God in the flesh. God become human. And yet when we see Jesus intentionally choosing solitude, silence, and prayer, we see him believing that he needed those things. He needed to do these things. He needed solitude. He needed to do away from all the other people, all their needs, all their demands. He needed to get away from all the sounds, the human sounds, the natural sounds that were there in the city. He needed to go out where he could be alone with God. It's through our experience of solitude, silence, and prayer that we give God space to work in our life, that our life with God becomes possible. These three that we looked at two weeks ago are some of the disciplines, some of the practices that God gives us that enable us to find our life in Christ, that life in Christ that we read about in places like Philippians 4, the life of rejoicing, the life where we give him all our anxieties, the life where we find the peace that transcends all understanding, the life that is content no matter what's happening no matter our circumstances, the life where we can say that Christ in us strengthens us so we can do all things, the life that in Christ finds the provision that God gives us through his riches and glory in Christ. It's these disciplines, these practices that give God the space in our lives to make all these a reality. In today's text here in Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus doing solitude again. He had been with the crowds. All the crowds have been gathered around John the Baptist, coming out to hear him preach, coming out to be baptized by him, and Jesus came out as one of them. And at the end of Matthew 3, we see Jesus presenting himself for baptism. We could go into that in more detail, but that's a separate message. But Jesus is there with the crowds. But then immediately... Looking at the story in Mark, Mark tells it with that word immediately, immediately. Jesus is driven, cast out, led into the wilderness. And if you look at the text there, you'll see that it wasn't an accident. It was the spirit that was doing it. It was the spirit that was taking Jesus out into the wilderness. It was the spirit that instigated it. And Matthew tells us that Jesus was out there in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. 40 days, that's plenty of solitude, isn't it? Plenty of silence. We see this other spiritual discipline added on top of the solitude and silence Jesus experienced. It's the discipline that we call fasting. Fasting as the intentional withdrawal from food. What does fasting do for us? Well, I know when I fast, I become more aware of my body. Sometimes in life, I just feel like a, a brain on a stick. I, my eyes give me the world. My ears let me hear the world. And my body, I just carry it around with me. But when I fast... My hunger, the rumblings in my stomach, the part in my mind that says you need to eat because you always eat. All of that makes me aware of my body. And by fasting, 
by saying no to my body for some set amount of time, even if it's only a single meal, I can develop some skill at reducing my body's control over me. My body is not my boss. My body is part of me. Yes, God made us embodied beings, physical beings. And that physicality, that having a body is good. But it wasn't God's plan that we be controlled by our bodies. And fasting helps us learn to say no. Fasting helps us learn to put our body in its place. We say no even to good things. God made us so that we eat. God made us so that we eat every day. God made us so that we eat multiple times every day. Fasting is not saying no to bad things. That's a good thing to do. Fasting is saying no to good things for the sake of other good things. When we fast, we enlist our bodies in aligning us with God's kingdom and God's kingdom ways. In my own experience, I find fasting to be difficult. If I fast for, say, a half hour, my body starts saying, where's that snack? Or if dinner's delayed by 20 minutes, where's dinner? I'm hungry, I'm starving. I'm not starving. My body's just used to eating. Fasting is hard for me. Sometimes I even get to the point where I'm convinced I can't do it. But I've also noticed that if I don't fast, if fasting is a discipline, I just say, oh, it's for other people. I miss out. It's a value to me. And if you try it, I think it'd be a value to you. And you can start off small. You can start off maybe fasting just one kind of food, maybe dessert, maybe soda, maybe meat. But then you might try one meal. Or you might cut out snacks. Just take little baby steps as you begin experiencing and trying out this discipline of fasting. So here in Matthew 4 is Jesus. Jesus has been led out into the wilderness by the Spirit. He's been fasting 40 days. And who comes to greet him but the devil? The devil is ready to take him down. The devil's first temptation to him, hey, Jesus, I've heard that maybe you're the son of God. And and back in the back of my mind, I can imagine that if I were the son of God, I'd have the power to turn a stone into bread, especially if I hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Oh, and Jesus, I might even be especially attracted to that rock right there. I, I sort of think it looks like a loaf of bread. Well, what do you think, Jesus? I mean, are you really the Son of God? I mean, you don't look like a Son of God. You look like an ordinary guy. So, yeah, you're probably just an ordinary guy. So, so what about it, Jesus? And we might think, oh, poor Jesus. Here's Jesus been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He must be so weak. But no, the discipline of fasting has made him strong. Because through fasting, through bringing his body into subjection to his spirit, he can be entirely subjected to God and to what God's doing. It's this that enables Jesus to recognize this temptation as temptation. Because otherwise, it might just come across as, that's a good idea, devil. I mean, where does it say in the Bible, thou shalt not turn stones into bread when you're really hungry and have the power to turn stones into bread? You can search the whole Bible, and you won't find any text anywhere that says, do not turn stones into bread. So if our idea of the Christian life and what we're supposed to do is looking for exact commands or exact prohibitions, then why wouldn't we just say, hey, Jesus, you're hungry? Just turn the thing into bread. Sounds like a good idea. But how does Jesus respond? 
Does Jesus say, oh, good idea, Satan, I think I will. Or does he defend his sense of identity? Hey, Satan, I am the Son of God. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to do just what you said I probably couldn't do. I'm going to turn that stone into bread. Just you see. Or does he say, hey, you're the devil. I'm not supposed to listen to you. Well, Jesus doesn't do any of that. Jesus comes back with a scripture verse. He says, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What are we to think? Are we to think, oh, Jesus, you were so lucky. You managed to bring your Bible out in the wilderness. So when the tempter came, you were able to pull out your Bible, and he actually gave you the time to whip through it all and find that verse so you could read it to him. Well, no, that's not it, because in those days, individuals did not have Bibles like we do. Or we might think, oh, yeah, Jesus, he's just God. We've, we've already admitted that up front. He's God in the flesh. He just knew it all because it's his word. Well, yes, he is God in the flesh. But I don't think that's what we're seeing here. I think we're seeing Jesus who throughout his life operated entirely as a human being, yet a human full of the Spirit. So we're here seeing Jesus who had studied Scripture, Jesus who had engaged with Scripture, Jesus who had memorized Scripture, Jesus who had made himself fully available to the Spirit so the Spirit could bring that verse to mind when he needed it. Now, our first thought when we recognize all that is that this is good for us. Because if Jesus knew this verse and was able to parry the devil's thrust with it, because he's God in the flesh, that doesn't do us much good because we are not God in the flesh. We're humans, only humans. And we can memorize it. But then maybe we're already having a second thought. I know some of you are thinking, but I can't memorize anything. I've tried all my life. I've tried since I was a little kid in Sunday school. I've tried since I was in school, and they told me I had to memorize some poem. I can't memorize anything. Well, maybe you can't, but maybe you can. How much have you tried? How much effort have you put into it? How much have you tried with other people and not just on your own? Have you ever been in a place where you feel the need to do it? Where it's not just something somebody is telling you, you ought to do this, or this would be a good idea. But how often have you actually felt it would be good for me to memorize Scripture? And have you given it a context? Have you had it in a context in your life so the Scripture is not just some random set of words that come to you? but words that come to you with meaning, words that come with uses attached to them. Now, some of the good news for us here is it's not magic. It's not like we have to get the words exactly right. If If you ever watch movies or read books about magicians, magicians are always getting in trouble because they have this spell, this set of words they're supposed to say, and they get it a tiny bit off and disaster happens. And we might imagine sometimes if we don't quote the verse exactly right, the devil's going to say, ha, you didn't say it exactly right, so it has no power in your life. Nah, I don't think so. If for nothing else, the proliferation of translations gets us past that. The key thing is to get the gist of the Scripture, the overwhelming focus of the scripture in our minds and in our hearts because broadly taken our engagement with scripture gives God room to speak into our lives now that can come through simple reading just picking up the bible and reading it however much of it we do the more we do the more more room we give God it comes from study of scripture study looking at the forest maybe a whole book at, a, at the time, 
and also the trees, looking at single passages, maybe even a single verse from time to time. It also comes from listening to Scripture. Nowadays, if you have a smartphone, you can find free apps out there that have Scripture available to you in multiple translations for free. It's so awesome. Or you can be in a setting where you're listening to other people read it. I already mentioned memorization. In the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorization is a powerful way to engage with Scripture. There's also meditation. Meditation is a step beyond memorization. Meditation is where we take that Scripture that we've internalized and we ruminate on it. We think on it over and over again. If it's a story, we might imagine ourselves into the story. If it's a promise, we might pray that promise. If it's a commandment, we might pray something like, Lord, thank you for this commandment. Help me to live it your way in my life. In all of these ways, Scripture becomes a resource in us for the Spirit to use. I think of what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 19 and 20. This, this is the context of Jesus sending out the disciples. He's chosen them. He's taught them. He's trained them. They've been his apprentices for some time. They've seen how to do what he wants them to do. And now he's sending them out. And he warns them, you're going to come up into places and you're going to be under threat. You're going to be under trial. You're going to be under testing. And people are going to ask you questions and you're not going to go know what to say. But in that hour, the Spirit's going to speak through you. Now, we, we might imagine there that what G's saying is that the Spirit's just going to make words pop in your head out of the blue. And yeah, that can happen. But I think it's also what we see Jesus doing in Matthew 4. I think because Jesus had built the word into his life, into his mind, into his very being, that those were tools then available to the Spirit in his life. And as we memorize, as we meditate, as we make Scripture part of our being, that means when we're in a time of testing, whether it's Satan himself, whether it's the habits in our own life, the voices in our head, the voices from the world around us, we can respond with Scripture as the Spirit directs us because we've loaded our toolbox with those Scriptures. So when we see Jesus here in Matthew chapter 4, it's not just Jesus opposing the devil in his divine nature. It's Jesus, fully human, fully prepared, now filled and guided by the Holy Spirit. Jesus' immediate preparation for this event was fasting. Fasting this time, 40 days and 40 nights. And although Scripture doesn't say it, I sure bet this wasn't his first time to fast. I bet it was a long established discipline in his life. And this was the fruition of that long established discipline. That's his immediate preparation, fasting. But the long-term preparation that enabled Jesus to come through this victoriously was his engagement with Scripture, his imbibing Scripture, his digesting Scripture, his making the Word of God part of his very soul. Those are things we can do. We can fast. We can engage with Scripture. We can memorize Scripture. We can meditate on Scripture. And when we do those things, we can then do what Jesus did. In the negative sense, yes, we can resist the adversary. Whether the adversary is Satan whispering in our mind, whether the adversary is our culture around us trying to mold us in its own image, trying to redirect our loves and our desires and our hungers toward things that aren't in line with God. But even more so, when we do these things, we can do what Jesus did and say yes to God. In fact, the more we say yes to God, the more we do the things that are positive responses to God's calling and direction in our life, the less time we're going to have 
to do those other things, those things that are suggestions of the enemy, those things that lead to our destruction or the destruction of the people around us. But the question today is, we've been given these disciplines. We've been offered these practices. Will we take them up? Will we take them up for ourselves and not just say, well, that, that's okay for preachers. That's okay for Sunday school teachers. That's, that's okay for kids. Or that's okay for adults. But me, I'm, I'm too busy. Me, I can't fast. I can't memorize anything. Man, I even get lost when I'm trying to go home. No, you don't. You make it home, you've memorized the directions. Are we going to take up these disciplines so that we can achieve that vision we have for life in Christ? They are available. Will you take them up and claim them for yourself? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for these disciplines, the gift of these disciplines, the gift of fasting, the gift of scripture. Help us not treat either one as magic, as, okay, I fasted, now I have control over God, or, or I've got this Bible and it's a talisman I hold out. But Lord, help us use them both your way. Let your word become part of our thinking, part of our feeling, part of our valuing part of our desiring. Make that a reality in our lives today. Amen. Our closing hymn today is, it is well. How do you think Jesus would have responded uh, right after Matthew 4.11? He, he's been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He, he's been tempted by the devil. He's gone through all this experience. How do you think Jesus would respond if he said, hey, Jesus, how are you doing? Do you think he would have said, hey, I'm happy? Uh, he might be happy, but I think that's pretty inadequate. Or, or would he say, oh, I'm sad, I'm so hungry, I had a chance to turn stones into bread and I didn't do it, man, Where, where's the closest McDonald's? No, I think Jesus would have said something like it is well with my soul. I have food to eat people don't know about. I am feasting on the word of God, so it is well with my soul. Like Jesus, we're going to face times of adversity, times of trial, times of testing, times that produce anxiety. As we sing this song, it is well. For some of you, it's going to be a time of thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you that it is well with my soul. For others of you, it's going to be a prayer of aspiration. Lord, it's not now well with my soul. But Lord, I sing this because I want you to make it a reality in my life. So if you're able to, will you stand as we sing? like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul is well with my soul Though Satan should buffet Though trial should come Let this blessed assurance control That Christ has regarded Stay
the message of Jesus. Jesus out of doors, Jesus out in the wilderness, Jesus fasting 40 days, Jesus confronted by the tempter, Satan who wanted to take him down so he could take us down. And yet Jesus stood full of the spirit and the power of the word. Go forth now as those who claim those same resources, as those who claim those same disciplines and practices of fasting, of solitude, and of engagement with God's word. Go forth in that confidence and letting God have those areas of your life to make you strong for him. Amen. Amen. 